welcome to the Wibbly Wobbly Timey Wimey podcast. I'm Lucia Kelly, expert at applied analysis and lost causes are my speciality. And I'm Talia Franks, media critic, fanfic enthusiast, and I approach everything with caution or abandon, one of the two. And we're here today to talk about a Wibbly Wobbly not so mini mini sorry. <laughs> Although I feel like the last three have not been so mini mini <laughs> Uh, yeah, I actually even put that on the tin for the last one. We've given up at this point. We can't do mini sets. We're trying. We really can't do mini sets. <laughs> <laughs> Today we're here to talk about Flux, the 13th series of Doctor Who, all at once. Woo! Reminder that time isn't a straight line. It can twist into any shape, but as such, this is a fully spoiled podcast. We might bring things in from later in the show, the comics, the books, the audio dramas, or even fan theories and articles. With that out of the way, the Doctor is being trisected across disparate dimensions and is split across three realities. So let's get in the TARDIS. Hey there, this is Lucia from the future. This episode covers some triggering subject matter. So we wanted to put in a content warning for discussions of trauma, specifically PTSD and other emotional responses relating to verbal and mental abuse during childhood, as well as discussions of death, processing grief, and genocide. Please take care of yourselves. Listening to us talk about heavy subject matters like this shouldn't come at the cost of your own mental health and well-being. And if this episode isn't for you, that is completely okay. And we hope you have a lovely rest of your day. With that, It's time to jump out of the TARDIS and into the episode. Catch you on the other side. Wikipedia's summary is Jodie Whittaker returns for her third and final series as the 13th Doctor, the most recent incarnation of the Doctor, an alien time lord who travels through time and space in their ship, the TARDIS, which externally assumes the appearance of a British police box. The 13th series also stars Mandip Gill and John Bishop as the Doctor's travelling companions, playing Yasmin Khan and Dan Lewis respectively. The series follows the 13th Doctor and her companions as they navigate a universe-ending anomaly called the Flux, while dealing with enemies and secrets from the Doctor's past. Our summary is that this is the most wibbly wobbly season yet, featuring Thasman so potent it's an affront they didn't kiss, an unnecessary but relatively inoffensive white man that we can't help but like, villains with bits to die for, literally, gaslighting colonizers, star-crossed lovers, man's best friend, and women constantly and consistently leading every scene. I think, not to spoil anything, but I think I'm going to come down on Fabulous for Flux as a whole. Individually, it sure was a roller coaster. Having recently watched it all as one cohesive story, it was pretty good. There were many gaps, but I was much more willing to go on that journey and forgive those gaps when I saw them all together. Yeah, I feel like And so this is very unfair that you never finished watching the finale, because I feel like if you finished watching the finale, you would agree with me that the finale does work very well as a finale. Having watched all six of them together, like my belief in that is even further confirmed, because honestly, I feel like part of the reason I enjoy the final episode so much as a finale is that I feel like the final two episodes are a finale together it's not just that the vanquishers is a finale episode it's that survivors of the flux and the vanquishers work together to end cap the season yeah I definitely see that It makes me wonder, I've heard a lot of criticism, criticism in the literary sense of the term, that this show suffers from comparing it to Netflix binging. Like, it works better as one cohesive whole. It works better as a sort of extended movie to split it up into the six parts and have those six parts 
spread out over a month and a half did not actually serve the story well. Yeah, I definitely think that it works better as one cohesive story. Like having watched it all as a binge, I didn't watch it all in one go. I watched it two episodes at a time over the course of three days. And like I said, I watched Survivors of the Flux and The Vanquishers back to back. And I think as a finale episode together, they work super well. I feel like the climax is right at the end of Survivors of the Flux, just at the beginning of the vanquishers and then the reason the vanquishers feels rushed in wrapping things up is because so much of leading up to the climax was in survivors of the flux well i remember us talking way back at the beginning on episode one when we were like i don't think it's fair to judge it because it's the first part of act one like that kind of carried through right episode one, episode two, three, four, five, six, they were all two parters of each act of the whole story. Mm-hmm. And so, again, watching them as individual separate things is like walking in halfway through Hamlet and then complaining that you don't know what's going on. Like, it's <laughs> it, it doesn't serve the story well. And I feel like mm-hmm. either as a whole, you really needed to dive into this idea of it being a cohesive story or you needed to actually make it more separate. Mm -hmm. And I'm leaning towards more separate. I mean, I'm honestly leaning towards making it more cohesive. I like the idea of it being a connected story. I mean, honestly, I think it works well as it is. I really enjoyed it. And I feel like, are there places where it could be better? Yes. But I feel like a lot of the places where people have criticisms, I can understand how they came to those points, but I feel like I disagree. So for example, to talk about something that we talked about last episode, Carvanisa, as I was rewatching and sort of keeping an eye out for the tells after Carvanista finds out about his whole species being destroyed. I feel like all his reactions and all the reactions of the other companions and of the other people in the story really made sense to me. Because for me, I mean, for one, I really did think that his howl made sense. I know that you didn't like it. Upon rewatching, I thought it felt sincere. They needed to turn up the bass. It was way too human. It was way too weak. I'm not going to change my mind. I'm sorry. (laughs) I feel differently. But like the fact that his reaction to the Centaurans killing all the Lupari was to kill all the Centaurans felt logical to me. Even down to the fact that he went off with Bell and Vinder made sense to me. Because, like, everyone, I've seen all these people being like, oh, Carvanisa should have gone off with Dan. And I'm like, no, I mean, I make jokes all the time about how I sheep Dan Vanista, but I don't actually. Like, Carvanista and Dan hate each other. They do not like each other. Them going off together would have made no sense. They are at best right now. Like, right now, as the story ends, their relationship is best described as tolerant, co-employees like that's it that's the extent of their relationship they've been put on a group project together and they hate each other's guts like (laughs) and don't get me wrong there's space for that to go somewhere else but that's not where it is right now (laughs) yeah no and so it makes so much sense for them to go off with Belle and Vinder because Belle and Vinder need somewhere to go they're gonna need a babysitter soon enough They need somewhere to go. They need a ship. It makes sense for them to go off not on their own. And also it makes sense for Carvanista to not be by himself because he's now the last of his kind. Like we thought the doctor was for so long. Like the doctor is again now that, well, one, there's no more Time Lords again because the master destroyed them all and turned them into Cybermen. But also we don't even know what the doctor's true species is. And it makes sense for him to not be isolated like that like when someone is 
grieving and suffering, you one, don't want them to be isolated, but two, you give them space to grieve without being on them all the time. Like when I have had family members pass as I did recently, the last thing I want is for someone to constantly be on me saying, I'm sorry for your loss and be constantly talking to me about it. It's not like I've immediately moved on, but also because there's no really moving on. I hate that. I hate the phrase move on, but it's also no one wants to focus on that pain full time. And especially when one's entire species is gone, like how does one even conceptualize of that? So I think everyone giving space to Carvanista and not coddling him about it, especially because he's a person who puts so much distance between himself and other people to begin with, I think makes a lot of sense. Also the people who say, this is just another nitpick, not nitpick, but another point where I feel outraged. The people who say that Yaz doesn't feel empathy or emotion for other people, they can choke, okay? <laughs> like I've seen people say that Yaz didn't show empathy when Carvanista died. That is not true. Or that Yaz didn't feel anything when Jericho died. That is absolutely not true. Just look at Manda Gill's face. When Jericho dies, the way she just softly says his name, even when Gerald and Jean die in Village of the Angels and weeping, weeping, she didn't even know those folks. So hang on, who, who are these people that are saying that Yasmin doesn't feel things? The, uh, she, uh, but she's the compassion companion. We see, no, what are you guys watching? Because it's not what I'm watching. Like, she's the heart companion. She's got a little glowing heart above her head. That's her role in the group. Yeah, no, these, the <laughs> yeah, these are the same people who on Twitter, as soon as they saw that clip of Dan on Halloween saying that he wasn't going to give candy to the guy with the eggs said that they already liked him more than Yaz and Ryan because he had more personality than them. Okay, I want to, that, oh, 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 all that unexamined racism and misogyny. Oh, wow. <laughs> so again, this is why I have to say, this is why I was predisposed not to like Dan, and this is why a lot of people were predisposed not to like Dan, because people love Dan and hate Yaz and think that Yaz has no personality and Yaz does not have an arc or Yaz does not have anything to her. And that's just untrue. It's untrue. That's not what's happening. Yaz definitely has been underutilized. Like Chris Chibnall, the writers have done Yaz and the 13th Doctor a disservice. They have not written them the way they need to be written. But honestly, the way people say, especially also the people, the, the people who say that Ryan doesn't have an arc or a personality drive me nuts. Because we'll get to this when we get to seasons 11 and 12 in the far future. But Ryan has one of the most beautiful arcs of any of the companions in the series. Like, it's just, it grinds my gears, honestly. Like, the racism is popping out in these people. And I don't even know if these people know that it's racism. Like, it's so unexamined. Yeah, no, I was thinking about, well, here's the other thing that's really weird, is that I feel like in a bizarre turn of events, Dan was underutilized. Like they brought on this white man, and for what? What did he, it's so weird going back to the Halloween apocalypse. And, they set up all these character hooks for him. They've got the fact that he's, you know, 
broke. He refuses soup, even though he's got nothing in his cupboards. He's got this problem with pride. So we're going to be doing something about how Dan, like clearly his arc is going to be something about learning how to deal with pride, learning how to balance his inner and outer life, you know, self-worth maybe, like figuring out that whole action. And even, even the bloody, you know, one sentence backstory info dump about how he was left at the altar. Like we get little drops of stuff and then nothing is done with it. He's just there to be a funny man. Yeah. What's going on? (laughs) Yeah, honestly, with Dan, it's very much, okay, you're fine, but what is the point of you? That's why in the intro summary I wrote, I was like, he's relatively inoffensive and we like him well enough, but also just what's the point of him? I don't dislike him, but what's the point of him? (laughs) Like he doesn't need to be here. He's literally just here to be, which also, that's another thing that I only found out later. Apparently, John Bishop is a comedian. Like, that's his thing. He's a stand-up comedian. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. It just struck me as bizarre. Like, (laughs) well, because, again, you've hired a comedian and you don't, even really use him for jokes like above mandip's head is a little heart to show that she's the heart companion and above john bishop is like a little comedy theater tragedy mask to show that he's the comic relief and neither of them were used and you've even hired a comedian to be the comic relief and all of the jokes you give him are subpar they barely pass muster like what why have you you've already got one companion that you don't use properly and instead of fixing that you bring on another one and run them both at half gear what's going on yeah i need answers i did think after watching all of this it did solidify for me how much I enjoyed 13's journey as the doctor across the different seasons and I just really really love the timeless child I think it's done something really different with Doctor Who and I think the way in which it's changed the narrative of the doctor has made things really interesting and special for me. And I really appreciate especially how the doctor doesn't open the watch at the end and leaves it in the custody of the TARDIS. I don't know if you've seen that video on YouTube. I'll put it in the episode description, but there's a video that's an interview with Chris Chibnall and Jodie Whittaker where they talk about the journey that the doctor goes on. And something that Chris Chibnall says that really sticks with me, he says something along the lines of how this is very much an adoption narrative and how the doctor is seeking these answers. But once she finds them, like seeking them and finding them is different so once she has them actually opening the watch and discovering these new aspects of herself is a whole different story because the doctor already has an identity that she's happy with and so opening the watch could potentially change that identity and change how she views herself and I find that particularly moving because the way I think about it is seeking information and finding it and actually engaging with it are two completely different things. It's kind of like a be careful what you wish for, right? Because if someone wants to know something, it's kind of like info hazards, right? If the knowledge can change how you view yourself and how you view your own history, it can be a really big change. And also it's not 
even unprecedented in Doctor Who. Because if you think about human nature and family of blood, the first time we see the chameleon arc with the 10th Doctor, John Smith really doesn't want to open the chameleon arc because once he does, his identity completely disappears and he just becomes the Doctor. So I think Mm -hmm. there might be some part of the Doctor that might have that fear that if she opens the fob watch her identity as the doctor might be subsumed by these past lives that she's lived because she doesn't know how many there are like she Mm -hmm. says were there hundreds were there thousands like the weight of those lives could overwhelm her and change her to be a different person. And also (laughs) another bone to pick with people on Twitter. I've seen people say that it doesn't make sense for the memories to be in the fob watch and for her to still have some of them be buried. That's bullshit because again, human nature, family of blood, John Smith still had all those dreams about the doctor that he filled that little notebook with. He still had some of those memories that were latent in his mind. So People just don't be remembering this episode. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, And that is such an excellent sort of the idea of the memories bleeding through, right? I talked about this last episode. I adore how they've meshed the sci-fi elements with the metaphor. Like the way that this storyline is halfway between metaphor and reality in terms of the way that it's addressing both an adoption narrative and also an abusive childhood narrative it's just everything to me I love everything about it and this idea of latent memories that have been locked away or hidden for your benefit in the same way that the brain shuts out memories that could be harmful or painful to you in order to survive but that the impact of those memories and the impact of your experience still very much lives within you and you can have access to those memories either when the brain accepts that you are strong enough to accept them or in states of unconsciousness like dreaming. The way that they've meshed that together is excellent. I do have, and I think this is coming as someone who does have memory issues a bit. I find your point about would the person we know as the doctor even be the doctor anymore if they could remember everything and would that change them as a person? Interesting. Because if I had access to my memories, like very key memories that have been taken from me, I would want them in a heartbeat. And I guess that's why last episode I was so on the fence about the way the episode ended and why I had this desire for the doctor to open the watch anyway, that this idea of, I don't know, I guess from my perspective, it's not so much the knowledge of the memories or the access to the memories, but how you process them and how you view them. So you can look on your past and see where you've come from and differentiate yourself from that person. And I think there are many things in the Timeless Children arc that I personally relate to and I find it much more difficult to separate myself from it as a fiction. So I do get that. I have a very different perspective, mostly because so, so it's interesting, right? Because for one thing, I also have a lot of memory issues. So, okay. So one thing that's interesting about it is that it's very different from real life because the doctor didn't lock those memories away because of trauma. Those memories were taken from her. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't something that her brain chose to do to protect itself. That was something that was stolen. That wasn't a choice made by her. That was a choice made by someone else. That was her autonomy being taken away. So that's one sense in which it's different. But at the same time, the reason that I identify with her choosing not to take the memories is because I also have PTSD from some like bad shit that happened. And I have intentionally forgotten a lot of things and I do not want those memories back. I don't remember exactly everything that happened, but I know it was bad and I don't want to remember it. 
<laughs> those memories are intentionally gone, intentionally locked away. I want none of it. <laughs> like, I know some of the big details of what happened, and that's enough. <laughs> I don't want anything else. And so that's enough for me. So mm-hmm. I very much identify with not wanting anything to do with it. I also want to say I did hear actually from multiple perspectives, which made me just, I was talking to you about this earlier, but I have heard from several different people who talk about Doctor Who and were reviewing it, podcasts, articles, the like, who questioned Basically, the bottom line of their point was that, like, if the doctor can't remember it, it can't affect them. So what's the point? Like, you can't have trauma from something that you can't remember. And I'm here to tell you, as someone with trauma that I can't remember, and as someone who has deep knowledge of abuse and trauma and how that works on the human brain, Memories you can't remember absolutely affect you. And recommended reading for everyone who is listening to this is The Body Keeps the Score. Look it up, read it right now. People with memory problems, specifically due to abuse or trauma, are absolutely affected by the abuse or trauma they can't remember. Please don't think that. Yeah, no, there is a bunch of things that trigger me and I have traumatic responses to. And I'm like, I don't know why this is a trigger, but it's really bad, probably because of something I can't remember. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm definitely going to put that link in the show notes as well. Please just, even if you read the summary, like the body keeps the score. Even if you personally can't remember something, your body does. Please believe people when they say that they have trauma, even if they can't remember it. (laughs) Yes, I (laughs) am. All right. Now that we've got all the heavy shit out of the way. um... (laughs) Let's talk about genocide. (laughs) (laughs) Sure thing, Talia. What do you want to bring up first? Well, I want to bring up the fact that for some reason, and you mentioned this last episode, and it's been marinating in my brain, that the doctor, that it seems out of character for the doctor to kill the Centaurans and the Daleks and the Cybermen and not have more deliberations about the consequences of committing genocide against them. That doesn't make sense to me. I feel like the doctor can be very cold-blooded. The doctor is absolutely capable of that because, so the thing is, I know So I've had like several days to think about this since we recorded. And so I basically went through and thought about all the times I could remember. And so like talking about parting of the ways, the doctor like absolutely was willing to kill the Daleks. He only didn't do it because he wanted to save the humans. He was fine when Rose killed all of them. He was just upset that Rose like was going too far and bringing like Jack back to life and had absorbed the time vortex and was basically like he thought she was going too far with all that journey's end 10-2 killed all the Daleks and 10-2 was the doctor (laughs) like he had all the doctors like faculties yes main 10 got all high and mighty about it but like doomsday 10th doctor chucked all the Daleks and the Cybermen into the void and also again family of blood human nature like Dr. Coldblooded chained up a guy to I forget exactly what it was but he like chained up a guy to like live in the heart of a storm or whatever he like trapped a little girl in a mirror forever he like he tra- he trapped the form that had taken the body and shape of a little girl yeah that was just the shape <laughs> um 
he like trapped another form into as a scarecrow until the end of time or whatever like he he can be like and so if all if all the male doctors can be like this like why is it that people are so upset about the woman doctor also being like this anyway I'm just saying the doctor can be cold-blooded just think about a good man goes to war and how he blew up all those cyber ships just to make a point that he wanted to know where Amy was just so that Rory could be dramatic (laughs) anyway yeah I'm not I'm not arguing okay so I want to I want to clarify first of all this is going to be the rare instance might be once in a lifetime where I actually don't think misogyny is at play. What I specifically had an issue with was the fact that the narrative seemed to be taking this action so lightly. I completely agree with you and I appreciate that you brought sources. (laughs) (laughs) The doctor can absolutely be, be just ice cold and perform horrendous acts and really sadistic and very there's a there's a craftsmanship to it almost in some cases the doctor knows how to be cruel I'm not arguing that the doctor especially especially in New Who has 100% been set up as a morally gray character with both extreme good and extreme bad parts what I had an issue with specifically was the fact that there was no sense of so like in all the instances that you've brought up, parting of the ways, journey's end, human nature and the family of blood, doomsday, good man goes to war. In all of those instances, the fact that like the doctor is in the wrong here, the doctor is doing something that can be, that is objectively horrible. Like, regardless of who they're doing it against, right? Like, we all know the depths of evil that Cybermen and Daleks and everyone else can perpetuate, that committing mass genocide, the act, is a bad thing, and that the Doctor is committing it with that knowledge. The issue I had was that none I didn't feel any of that in the finale I didn't feel like which was doubly bizarre because there are attempts made I don't believe that they were successful but there are attempts made to impress upon the audience that genocide against the Lupari is a bad thing right that that's a tragedy that that is something to be mourned and to be acknowledged and then they just like flip it right over and do the whole eye for an eye revenge thing where it's well then I'll commit genocide against you and it and it comes right back to a point that Swarm makes actually where it's yeah stop committing murder or we'll or like we'll murder you yeah but actually that makes a lot of sense to me and so this is gonna sound weird But I feel like it's examined in the way that it's not examined, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like, so the doctor, if you think about how the doctor has that moment with time, where time Mm -hmm. says, be wary of the forces that mass against you. And if you think about how the doctor has just become at this point like so powerful it feels like at this point the doctor is is almost unstoppable and 
is sort of heading towards a reckoning and it is unexamined. If you think about how Swarm is like, oh, that's hypocritical. Like, you tell us to stop killing or we'll kill you. Think about how Tech Tayun says, like, they're your experiments just as you were mine. And the doctor says, no, we're not the same. Every time these villains are trying to make points at the doctor that are not correct, but not necessarily incorrect. And the doctor is just denying, denying. Yet we're seeing in like the narrative, if we have a keen eye, that like they are in fact kind of making points. So I have to wonder if the way that we're supposed to be examining this is that the doctor is almost, again, losing sight in not being held accountable. Because it also has to do with the fact that the way in which this doctor engages with companions is by being very secretive and by not letting companions in up until this like very last scene with Yaz that Dan interrupts but if we think about how this doctor is so closed off and so unable to be held accountable like this doctor definitely is heading for reckoning because there's that moment again where she says like this isn't actually a flat team structure it's mountainous with me at the top so again I feel like the reason it's unexamined is because we're heading towards it all like accumulating. As long as they don't do the Time Lord Victorious shit again. Like I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, that was bad enough the first time round. I'm not doing, don't do that. Like I, I think the 13th Doctor is definitely in line for a reckoning. I hope that it, I just want it to be done well, is my, is my thing. I feel it's, it's been over a decade now, which is wild to think about, but it's been over a decade and I'm still mad at how they ended Ten's run because it did not make sense for the character. I mean, it made sense for the character, but like it was, and we'll sort of, we'll see if my opinion has changed once we get to it, but like, I remember in that moment while I was watching in the several moments, watching the specials and watching the decline of 10, how that felt in my, in my soul, how that was such a betrayal of the character that had been set up. And I just, I don't want that for 13. I'm hoping for some, for some better constructive narrative. Yeah. It's really interesting to think about 10, because if you think about how 10 was only 10 for if you believe the doctor was always lying about their age for about eight years Mm. I never liked how like suddenly 11 was a thousand or however many years old like it just never felt true or real and felt unearned (laughs) definitely did feel I mean I think it made sense for 11 to age that much Because he was, because 11 aged to 200 years that he was running away from his death. It does make sense for the doctor to run away from his death for 200 years. And then when he aged the thousand years, I think that was just to justify him getting that old. Because the doctor (laughs) stay young for like ever. So they needed a reason to justify the doctor actually aging. We're getting off topic. We'll get there when we get there, but I have there's so many problems that I have with Eleven. Anyway, now I think we actually have covered all of the terrible, deep, <laughs> angsty stuff. <laughs> Do you want to talk about something more fun? Sure. I love the Doctor's consistency and wanting to run a shop. I think it would be so cute if the doctor could run a little shop. I was thinking it would have made so much, I guess. Basically, I want scenes where we see 12 working part-time at the uni, 
uni bookshop is what I'm is what I'm wanting (laughs) you know he did it you know he finagled at least one shift (laughs) you know he managed it yeah definitely yeah no there were a lot of (sighs) okay one other thing Belle and Vinder's faces when they finally reunite like Vinder's face when he finds out that they're having a baby I rewound that and rewatched it like <laughs> five times because Jacob Anderson like his the way his eyes lit up that little smile like I adore it like I was worried when they were apart for so long whether or not those two actors Thadia Graham and Jacob Anderson would actually have chemistry together (laughs) because they were star-crossed lovers they never actually (laughs) interacted but when they finally did get together I was like oh they're so cute (laughs) they're so freaking cute yeah I'm gonna withhold my statement actually what's your statement tell me your statement I'm curious I think both Binda and Belle were very cute individually. I did not buy into their chemistry very much, which was really unfortunate because I wanted to so bad. (laughs) I like, they definitely gave the impression of they could build that chemistry though. Like I can see it. I can see, I see the vision. It's just out of focus. (laughs) You're a hater. (laughs) I promised we'd do this last episode and now we're nearly at the end of this one. We need to give Swarm and Azure their time. Let's talk about these villains. They are such interesting villains. I really liked them. I really liked them too. And I feel... (sighs) And, you know, I've seen some people say that they were defeated too quickly or that they didn't get their due diligence, but I don't feel like that's true. I feel like their end made sense. I feel like their end will make more sense once we find out who, you know. So are we meant to believe that their master, like their savior, whatever, whatever, was time? Or was it a third party? So it was time. Okay. Yeah, I feel like there was definitely more space to explore with them. And I feel like that wasn't like, there are so many unanswered questions about the Ravagers. Also the fact that like, they're called the Ravagers and there's a very like big, big finish all about the Ravagers and they don't seem to be the same kind of people, which was a bit very confusing for me personally their whole look absolutely gorgeous served every single scene they were in I adored their relationship with the idea of faith and religion yeah I thought that was so great especially because Azur has that moment where she says that is your faith ours is true because Mm. I find the idea of, of someone's faith being true fascinating because like personally I'm like like personally I'm a polytheist who believes that there's validity in all faiths (laughs) like this weirds people out when I say that I think that all the gods exist but you know (laughs) whatever anyway I also think that the idea of there being balance to the universe is interesting because no the doctor says there's the balance to the the, universe yeah that's what the doctor says I find the doctor's view that there's balance to the universe interesting because whenever like someone in a story says that there needs to be balance to the universe that reads to me because when someone says there needs to be balance that means that there needs to be good things and bad things because a scale has to be even 
Mm. So like, I feel like if someone says that there needs to be balance, that means that they can't be like on the side of like net good because they believe in the necessity of evil. (laughs) I find that take fascinating because I read that interaction between Azure and the Doctor completely differently. When the Doctor was saying there must always be balance and Azure is sort of advocating for her view of the world, her true faith view of the world, as this idea of hedonism and excessism, specifically in this sort of not only worship of her idea of time, but her idea of destruction and her idea of death. The fact that the doctor's response is there must always be balance, to me, read as the doctor fighting for the idea of in the face of a person like Azure, the importance of fighting back for your own opinions and your own faith in goodness or life or success or, you know, you know, you know, back to Belle, you know, the mission is love, right? The mission is not, it's not about the end goal being balanced. The, the end goal the the mission is seeing all these competing different forces and making sure that your voice your mission is heard and seen and accounted for yeah so that makes sense and I think but I think isn't disagreeing from what I'm saying which is that the doctor in believing in balance also so I'm not saying, so I guess what I said before is that she believes in the necessity of evil, which is not true, but she believes in the inevitability of evil and destruction and thus the necessity for balance in the universe. So there will always be destruction. So there will always be people fighting against destruction. So if what she fears most is destruction, and so she's always trying to fight against, but she but she doesn't truly believe she either doesn't truly believe that it can be destroyed or she doesn't or perhaps I don't know if she truly wishes for it to be destroyed because if balance because without balance what is there because everything I don't know I go back to that but like everything has its time and everything ends like Mm. It's like everything is gone eventually. So it's like, I wonder about, I also wonder about the 12th doctors, like how he doesn't want to regenerate and how he had to be like forced to regenerate into 13. And it really makes me wonder like we said, 13's coming for a reckoning. So it makes me wonder what's going to cause her to regenerate. Because again, time says no regenerations. So I'm wondering yes. how that's going to happen. Yes, no, it's all very fascinating. That that last confrontation with time or conversation, however you want to sort of, it wasn't exactly a confrontation, but time, also the fact that time is like an entity that can talk to people and it's like, Okay. (laughs) But time gives this warning to the doctor. And yeah, I mean, obviously we know from an external point of view that there will be another doctor. So who knows what's going to happen next. I also find it fascinating. Again, as you say, everything has its time and everything ends. I was absolutely like, school reunion was so at the forefront of my mind watching this and specifically because Tech Dayun says something like almost identical to that at some point mm-hmm. and 
I'm just fascinated by the concept of like, I'm fascinated by the idea that the uh, everything has its time, everything ends philosophy is something that maybe came from Tactain in a latent way that the doctors still believed. And now this sort of fight against destruction philosophy that the doctor seems to be more aligned with now might be their sort of more true alignment and more true philosophy to them rather mm -hmm. than what has been uh, sort of enforced on them by Tectaean. But yeah, no, many different, many different paths, many different stories, many different ways that this whole thing could go. Yeah, I remember. So I'm just thinking about the different ways that the different doctors have regenerated and there's this and again there's this idea that the next doctor will be shaped how the last doctor regenerated and one of the things that the 12th doctor says when he's about to regenerate is they'll all get it wrong without me oh boy <laughs> so he's like saying like and, and it's this idea that the doctor is necessary to the universe and also this idea one of the and then also some of the other things he says is again that never be cruel never be cowardly like hate is always foolish love is always wise always try to be nice but never fail to be kind oh my gosh I've just had the thought do you think the doctor writes letters or notes to future generations of themselves maybe like, oh no I've made myself very sad <laughs> oh no hang on I've suddenly been put on this sidetrack of this idea of the doctor as this sort of incredibly concentrated generational line like the idea of there's this reoccurring concept of the doctor as yes the doctor is always the same character but each regeneration is a different person mm -hmm. like the they are so different from or they're meant to be so different from each other that they are essentially both the same and different people all at once and how that and even the uh, even the terminology regeneration brings to mind the idea of a family tree mm -hmm. and like descendants mm -hmm. and like I don't know the idea of the doctor as a person and a family really got to me <laughs> Uh, I with like a shared history that's passed down quite literally yeah it makes me wonder too about this idea of people having having doctors that are like their doctor because it's if doctors are like members of a family and it's I don't know I'm just sort of thinking about this idea of like family and, and community and like how how that interacts in terms of like intergenerationally but yeah I don't know I can't wait until we get to Capaldi because he's my doctor it's it's so weird because I dislike Moffat so intensely but I love 12 so intensely I think I've told you I've got my my like signed Capaldi photo like right above my desk so whenever I'm working I just see it's it's the quote from the regeneration speech <laughs> this is to Talia laugh hard run fast be kind best Peter Capaldi doctor question mark question mark <laughs> And it's a picture of the 12th Doctor and Bill, which is my one of my favorite Doctor companion combinations. But yeah, I love 12 so much. I can't wait until we get to him. It's literally, yeah. I love 13. 13 is like probably, I think 13 and 12 are honestly tied for my favorite Doctor. 
and then nine, 11, 10 dead last for the modern doctor. <laughs> And then I love I love the Ruth Doctor, Fugitive Doctor, but I feel like we just haven't seen enough of her for me to properly rank her. Give Jar Martin her own series. Yeah, like at least give her a big finish. Like at the very least, she needs a big finish. Like. Give us the big finish of how she and Carvanista met. And on that note, dear sweet listeners, thank you for joining us. It has been, it has been a pleasure. In our very wibbly wobbly timey wimey way, we have given you a very not mini mini sode. We <laughs> hope you enjoyed. Wait, wait, one more thing. I never explicitly said it, but I do think that Flux deserves a fabulous. You said it at the top. I'm saying it at the bottom. We're sandwiching it. This is a fabulous series. I already pre-ordered the DVDs. <laughs> special features, special features. <laughs> <laughs> Cannot wait. <laughs> All right. We'll see you next time for Christmas Invasion. Wee! <laughs> yeah, it should be coming out next week from when this episode is released. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Wibbly Wobbly Timey Wimey Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this adventure with us through space and time. You can find us elsewhere on the internet on Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram at WibblyPod. Follow us for more Wibbly Wobbly content. You can find out more information about us and our content on wibblywobblytimeywimey.net and full transcripts for episodes at wibblywobblytimeywimey.net slash transcripts. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can send us an email at wibblywobblytimeywimeypod at gmail.com. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and other platforms as it helps other people find us and our content. That's all for now. Catch you in the time vortex.